How did the Romans manage to make water flow uphill? This intriguing misconception actually hides an even more impressive truth. The truth about precise calculations, gravity, and unparalleled engineering genius. The Romans did not defeat the laws of physics. They subjugated them with such precision that it still inspires awe today. They created arteries of stone and concrete that carried life to their vast cities, feeding fountains, baths, and homes. Before we continue, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Roman Empire History, so you never miss any of our videos about ancient engineering and the secrets of the Roman world. Watch the video to the end, and you will learn how Roman engineers, using only simple tools and fundamental principles, specifications are precise, were able to build kilometer-long waterways that functioned reliably for centuries. What if I told you that aqueducts were not built solely to quench thirst? In fact, water in ancient Rome was much more than just a resource for survival. It was a currency, a status symbol, and a powerful tool of political control. Having a clean, abundant, and constant source of water was direct proof that a city was protected by civilization. Early Rome was completely dependent on the Tiber River, but as the city grew, its waters became increasingly polluted. The first aqueducts, such as the Aqua Appia, were built primarily to meet the basic needs of the population. However, the Roman elite soon realized the potential of water as a demonstration of power. The presence of an aqueduct meant that the city was capable of conquering nature and harnessing its resources for its own use. For wealthy citizens, connecting to the water supply was the ultimate sign of luxury. While ordinary citizens carried water from public fountains, patricians could afford private baths and decorative fountains in their villas. Obtaining permission for a private connection was a complicated and expensive process, making water a visible divider between social classes. Emperors quickly realized that control over water meant control over the population. The construction of new aqueducts and huge public baths, or therma, was a popular political move. This demonstrated the ruler's generosity and concern for the people ensuring the loyalty of the masses. The baths were not just a place to wash, but entire social centers accessible to virtually everyone. Water also played a crucial role in the economy and even in the military. Huge amounts of water were required for industrial processes, such as mining. The Romans used a method known as hushing, in which pressurized water jets were used to wash away rock and extract ore. This required the construction of complex temporary aqueducts in remote regions. The monumentality of the aqueducts themselves served as propaganda. The huge arches crossing the valleys were visible from afar and served as a constant reminder of Rome's power and engineering prowess. They made a lasting impression on both citizens and conquered peoples. It was architecture that asserted its dominance. Interestingly, aqueducts also became targets during wars. Destroying an aqueduct was one of the most effective ways to besiege a Roman city. By cutting off the water supply, the enemy could quickly bring the defenders to their knees. This further emphasizes how vital this infrastructure was to the city's survival. Thus, each new aqueduct was not just an engineering project, but a political statement. It strengthened the emperor's power, stabilized society, and demonstrated the superiority of Roman civilization. Water flowed through the channels not just for the sake of it, it flowed at the behest of Rome. This complex system required constant supervision and management. Special government services were created, such as the Cura Aquarum, which was responsible for the construction and maintenance of aqueducts. This service stood at the very heart of Roman infrastructure and reminded everyone, from the humblest citizen to the emperor himself, that water was not merely a natural resource. It was a state-controlled force of civilization, a symbol of order, and a tool of political authority. The official at its head, the Curator Aquarum, was often a man of consular rank, 
chosen for his competence and reliability. His appointment alone showed the importance Rome placed on water. Without continuous flow, public fountains would fall silent, baths would grow cold, and the very rhythm of Roman urban life would collapse. The aqueduct was more than engineering, it was ideology. It represented Rome's ability to harness nature, discipline the landscape, and bend geography to human will. But none of this began with stone or arches. The story of an aqueduct began far away from the city, on hillsides, in forests, and in deep valleys, with the work of the Aqualis, the water seeker. These specialists were the first link in a long and intricate chain. They walked the land with trained eyes, searching for springs, underground seepage, and natural clues that hinted at hidden water. Their methods were simple but refined through generations. Evergreen plants thriving in otherwise dry soil, morning fogs settling low in valleys, or warm patches where the earth exhaled vapor, all were signs of groundwater. The famous engineer Vitruvius described one method in detail, lying with one's chin pressed to the earth at dawn to spot the faint shimmer of rising moisture. Once a potential source was found, workers dug test pits to evaluate water quality and quantity. They observed how quickly the pit filled, examined the water for clarity, and boiled samples to check for residue. Sometimes they even offered the water to local residents to taste, trusting human experience as the most reliable indicator of safety. If the source was too weak, Romans did not abandon it immediately. They often built underground drainage tunnels that converged various small trickles into a single strong flow. Selecting the source was only half the struggle. Next came negotiating with landowners. Roman law strongly protected private property, so engineers had to secure every meter of ground through purchase or agreement. This legal maze could delay construction longer than any technical difficulty. Once permissions were secured, surveyors began the most extraordinary part of the entire endeavor, calculating a slope so gentle that the water would flow steadily for tens of kilometers without stagnating or rushing too fast. Roman engineers mastered gravity with astonishing precision, relying on tools that appear primitive to us, yet remain astonishingly effective. The most important instrument was the corobates, a long wooden beam supported on legs with a shallow channel carved across the top. When filled with water, the channel showed true horizontality. If the water touched both edges evenly, the beam was perfectly level. When wind disturbed the surface, surveyors confirmed alignment with plumb lines hanging from the sides. With this simple device, they determined and maintained slopes, sometimes as small as one meter per kilometer. Too steep and the channel risked destruction, too shallow and the water might stagnate. The aqueduct to Nîmes, including the famous Pont du Gard, descended only 34 centimeters per kilometer, so slight that the naked eye cannot detect it. Yet over its 50-kilometer course, the water flowed smoothly, guided only by gravity and human calculation. For more complex measurements, like aligning tunnels through hills, surveyors used the Dioptra, a precursor to modern surveying instruments capable of measuring angles with surprising accuracy. Straight lines were marked using the Groma, a cross-shaped tool with hanging plumb lines essential for establishing right angles. With the route set, Rome mobilized one of the largest construction forces in the ancient world. Legions were often assigned to the task, bringing discipline, organization, and engineering skill. Alongside them labored stonemasons, carpenters, blacksmiths, and countless unskilled workers who dug trenches, moved earth, and shaped the raw materials. Construction resembled a military campaign, supply chains were established, tools were repaired on site, and teams coordinated with the efficiency of an army. Whenever possible, engineers followed natural contours, but obstacles inevitably arose. When a hill blocked the path, it could be bypassed or pierced with a tunnel. Tunneling was perilous. 
Workers used fire setting, heating stone with fire and then cooling it rapidly with water to fracture it, before breaking the weakened rock with picks. Vertical shafts were dug from the surface to the tunnel line, allowing ventilation, removing excavated debris, and checking orientation. Even with careful planning, tunnels did not always meet perfectly in the middle, but Roman engineers corrected misalignments on the spot. Valleys required a different solution, the arch. The Romans perfected the semicircular arch, allowing them to span vast distances using relatively small blocks. Carpenters built massive wooden frameworks that mirrored the curve of the future arch. Masons then placed wedge-shaped stones along this curve, moving inward until they reached the keystone. Once the keystone was set, the arch stood on its own, and the wooden frame could be removed. Multi-tiered arcades like those of the Pont du Gard allowed aqueducts to cross deep valleys with elegance and strength. But most aqueducts were far less visible. About 80% of their length ran underground, protected from weather, contamination, and enemies. The key reason for Rome's speed and scale in construction was the revolutionary material known as Opus Cementicium, Roman concrete. Composed of lime, water, aggregate, and volcanic ash called pozzolana, this concrete hardened into a durable, water-resistant mass that could set even underwater. Foundations, walls, and supports were often made using a technique where two stone or brick walls were erected as a frame and then filled with concrete. Meanwhile, visible structures like arches were built with carefully cut stone blocks, often so precisely fitted that no mortar was needed. Inside the aqueduct, the real artery, the specus, carried the water. The channel was typically tall enough for a person to walk inside, allowing access for cleaning. To prevent leaks, workers lined the walls and floor with opus synonym, a waterproof mortar made of lime and crushed tiles. Once sealed, the channel was covered with stone slabs or a small arched roof, ensuring that water traveled in darkness, clean and cool. Yet even the best engineering could not prevent mineral deposits from forming. Water carried dissolved calcium that settled as thick travertine. If neglected, the channel could narrow dramatically, obstructing flow. Maintenance workers called a quarry descended through inspection shafts to scrape away the hardened layers with chisels and picks. The work was dark, cramped and exhausting, but absolutely essential to keeping the city alive. When the water reached the city, it entered the Castellum Aquae, a distribution tank designed with remarkable intelligence. Here, debris settled at the bottom, and the water flowed out through pipes arranged at different heights. This simple design reflected a carefully planned hierarchy of access. The lowest outlet, which always received water first, supplied public fountains, ensuring that the common people never lacked drinking water. Middle outlets served the public baths and city services. The highest outlets supplied private homes and wealthy customers who paid for the privilege. During shortages, these private connections were the first to lose water, while public needs continued uninterrupted. From the Castellum, the water traveled through a network of ceramic and stone pipes. For final connections, Romans used rolled lead. Pipes, known as fistulae, stamped with official marks that identified the manufacturer, the approving authority, and sometimes the property owner. This system helped administrators regulate water usage and identify illegal taps. The famous curator Aquarum Frontinus spent much of his career combating unauthorized connections, restoring vast amounts of water to the public supply. The abundance of water transformed Roman life. Public fountains became social hubs where neighbors exchanged news. The great bath complexes, massive facilities with hot and cold pools, steam rooms, gardens, and libraries offered relaxation and entertainment to thousands each day. Wealthy homes boasted private fountains and baths. 
craft industries relying on water flourished, and the excess water from aqueducts powered the Cloaca Maxima, washing wastewater from the city and preventing urban pollution. When the Western Roman Empire collapsed, the entire system of maintenance collapsed with it. Channels clogged, arches collapsed, and cities shrank as people returned to wells and rivers. Yet the legacy endured. Some aqueducts were repaired centuries later. The Aqua Virgo still flows today, feeding the Trevi Fountain. Others remain standing in majestic ruin, testifying to Rome's unmatched engineering vision. The Roman aqueducts were more than stone and mortar. They were the lifeblood of an empire, a triumph of human intellect over landscape, and a reminder that infrastructure is the foundation of civilization. From the first glimmer of moisture in a distant valley to the final splash of a city fountain, the aqueduct embodied Rome's genius for turning the natural world into an ally. It is a story of patience, precision, and perseverance, a story that still resonates every time water flows effortlessly from a modern tap. It flowed at the behest of Rome. This complex system required constant supervision, led by the Cura Aquarum, the Roman institution responsible for maintaining every aqueduct across the empire. At its head stood the Curator Aquarum, a high-ranking official whose authority reflected the enormous importance Rome placed on water. Without constant flow, fountains would fall silent, baths would cool, industries would halt, and the rhythm of Roman life would collapse overnight. Every drop reflected an ideology, Rome's belief that nature could be measured, mastered, and bent to the service of civilization. The journey began with water seekers in remote hills, continued through precise measurement, and ended in fountains, baths, and bustling streets. Even the most advanced sections, tunnels, arches, siphons, and underground channels, were maintained by teams who ensured the flow never stopped. And when the water finally reached the city, the Castellum Aquae divided it wisely. Fountains first, baths second, private homes last. After Rome's fall, the system decayed, but the aqueducts themselves endured, silent monuments to engineering brilliance. Some were restored centuries later. Others, like the Aqua Virgo, still flow today, proving that Rome's engineering was not just effective, but timeless. The aqueducts were Rome's lifeblood, a triumph of patience, precision, and genius that still shapes our world every time water flows from a tap. Subscribe to Roman Empire History to explore more engineering wonders of the ancient world.